Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a Right by the Sea screening of this pre-recorded event with two of Ireland's best loved writers, Dr. Rosalind McDonough and Lucy Caldwell. Dr. Rosalind McDonough is a traveller woman with a disability. Rosalind has a BA in Biblical and Theological Studies, an MPhil in Ethnic and Racial Studies, and an MPhil in Creative Writing, all from Trinity College Dublin. She also holds a PhD from Northumbria University. Her plays include The Baby Doll Project, She's Not Mine, Rings, The Prettiest Proud Boy and Mainstream. Her most recent commissions were Walls and Windows for the Abbey Theatre and Contentious Spaces for the Project Art Centre. Rosalind's first book of essays, Unsettled, has been described as fearless and ferociously honest and has been likened to the work of James Baldwin. For this pre-recorded event, Dr. McDonough was interviewed for Right by the Sea by Lucy Caldwell, who is the author of four novels, several stage plays and radio dramas, and two collections of short stories, Multitudes, published by Faber 2016, Intimacies by Faber in 2021, and her most recent novel, These Days, was published by Faber in March 2022. Lucy was the editor of Being Various, New Irish Short Stories, published also by Faber in 2019. Rosaline and Lucy could not be with us in person today, but they have recorded this interview exclusively for you at Right by the Sea 2022. So, even though they can't hear you now, Please put your hands together for Dr. Rosaline McDonough and Lucy Caldwell. Thank you so much. And um, thank you to everyone who's with us today. Um, Rosaline, it's such a great pleasure to be in conversation with you today. You say very firmly in the introduction to your beautiful collection of essays, Unsettled, that you're not an inspirational person, that you don't see yourself as a heroine, but I think what you are to me and to so many others is a shining light. Um, Anne has already spoken of the comparison that your work has drawn to that of James Baldwin. And I know that another artist to whom you feel a great connection is Frida Kahlo. Both of those artists made work from incredibly difficult places, be that the limitations or complications of their own bodies or the psychic torture of living in a systemically diseased society. But I think we appreciate their work, not because of that personal struggle, not because of the articulation of it, but because like all great art, it lifts and illuminates all of us. You say in your book that writing is a gift that has saved me from myself. And it is such a gift too for us readers. As Anne Enright says, um, beautifully written, and it is, it's funny and wise and ferociously elegant, like its writer. Um, but Anne Enright says, this book beats back the darkness. It brings us all further on. It will make you feel more properly alive. Um, Unsettled was published by the formidable Scheme Press last year. And it's a book I gave most as a gift to people last year, possibly one of the books I've given most ever. Um, it's the sort of book that I just wanted to press into everyone's hands. I wanted them to read it. I wanted to talk to them about it. Um, it's such an honor to get to talk to you about it today, Rosaline. And I hope that if there are any of you watching at home who haven't yet read Rosaline's book, you'll very shortly be moved to get on the Scheme website and, and order it straight away. Um, Rosaline, my first question to you is going to be about style. Um, you're incredibly stylish yourself and you write a lot about it. I love the way you write about traveler style and um, the glamour of the woman and um, the swagger. And I love the way you write about hair. Um, before talking to you this morning, um, I deep conditioned my own hair last night with an overnight mask. I blow dried it properly, even though I had the, the school run, um, because you say that style for you is a conversation, a sort of solidarity between women. Um, what you say, and I love this description, is that style is your way of letting other women know you've read the full Irish canon and know the difference between nylon and Egyptian cotton. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about the way you see style as messages and style as armour. Can you tell us more? Uh, hello, lovely Lucy. 
and I was trying to remember, I think it was 2018 or 16, you very kindly emailed me, you were, you were doing a, a collection of the stories, and I thought it was very kind of you, and I didn't get into the collection, but you were very nice to think of me, and that's why I'm so glad we're here together. And you were known as a writer, and you as a mother, that sometimes when we do our work, I'm usually in my pajamas, I usually have my hair unbrushed up in a bun. So, for me, style is, well, it's a lot of things. As a disabled woman, I suppose we have to over assert or reassert our aesthetic in many different ways. But also, our bodies as women, as Irish women, have been brutalized on so many levels, not just traveler women or women with impairments, but the Irish women collectively have been brutalized. And for me, it's dying. It gives me joy. It gives me pleasure. It gives me comfort. It's my armor against the world, against ableism, or sexism. It also, um, and for me, style is not about money. It's a very, I mean, I mostly shop second hand. But I don't remember that old phrase, old phrase, good taste. Remember, um, I suppose for me, it's about recognizing and honoring women who had no money, who weren't considered to have good taste, when in fact they had a marvel of taste and they were able to put things together. And, and, and also, I suppose, as a much younger woman, I used to dream one day I would write for a fashion, a fashion magazine. I hope that answers. It did. That used to be my dream as well, <laughs> Rosaline. <laughs> and um, yeah, I want to, it is my, my big regret with being various is that we didn't get a story by you in it. Um, and I loved reading recently that you're going to be publishing your own first collection of stories. You're working towards it at the moment, writing those stories. And I would love to hear more about those stories. I, I heard you say that your two of your favorite writers are Alice Munro and Elizabeth Strout, uh, both very fine writers. And both writers, I think, who write stories that seem to span worlds with characters who recur and different facets, different glimpses um, into a, a whole society. Are your short stories bits of a whole world? How are you working on the collection? I don't know, Lucy, to be honest, because most of all, after unsettled, as you will know from your own uh, career as a writer, it's exhausting. So it's taken me, I mean, one part of me thought, oh my God, I'll never write again. I have nothing inside of me, intellectually, emotionally. I have nothing in there. So just last week, 
I started to uh, collect my characters and, and uh, I suppose and I don't know what way it will turn out. I have no idea how uh, how it will develop. There will be a lot of travelers. There will be a lot of people who live in very contentious spaces. And there's a lot about embodiment. And there's a lot about men and women who are up for a bit of development. <laughs> who have a very ordinary life on the surface but underneath and they're up to all sorts of things. And also I think I'm writing about relationships and be they were friendships, familiar relationships or indeed intimate partner relationship. So I mean it's a work in progress. And I also I suppose I was really delighted to hear Claire Keegan on Morning Island this morning and she's now nominated for the Booker Prize for that wonderful uh, book. And uh, what was the name of it? Uh, Small things like these. I mean, it was just superb. And I'm, I'm delighted there. Uh, I don't know it's there, but I just feel, even since I wrote my own book, the women like herself involved in writing have been so generous and kind to me. Yeah, I think Claire's that novel, it's a perfect novel. Oh my God, yeah. I wrote it in one sitting. Yeah. And I heard her, I heard her speak, Rosaline, and she said that she wrote that book 40 times, <laughs> four zero. She did draft after draft, honing it until it was perfect. And I think, I think you can tell. And I wondered, I wanted to ask you, um, sometimes the way that I write is I, before I start typing, I will have spent a long time in my daydreams or walking along the street, letting the characters talk in my head, listening to the sentences, listening to the rhythms, the tone, the sort of musicality of the speech. And I wondered if, I know that when you're writing, when you were writing Unsettled, you used uh, an amanuensis, you dictated your work to someone. And I wondered, does that mean that you spend a lot of time writing in your head, editing in your head? Yeah, I suppose I... Life as it is, time is always very limited when you're dependent on someone else. You'll know with your children if you have a child minor or they're in a crash. Those few hours are for you to get your writing done, am I right? Yeah, absolutely. Everything gets neglected. The dishes, everything. I just sit down and fall into a, a yeah, the, the world shuts out. But you know you have a limited time span, mm -hmm. don't you? Mm -hmm. and for me, it's the same. So what I usually do, yeah, I have Olivia. Olivia is my writer. She's a wonderful woman. If I have her on a Wednesday, I will start thinking and researching on the Friday. By Sunday afternoon, I have my phone and I'll make a few notes. By Tuesday, I need to know the middle, the ending, and the introduction. I need to know what I'm doing on Wednesday. And then, if it's a good day, we're able to fly through it. 
<laughs> and the reason I am let go of my perspectives be there's a lot of internal work that goes on, you know, and um, I know it probably seems odd or slow or awkward to you because you use your hands. But my way of doing it, it works for my algorithms. It works for my characters or my material. It is normal to me. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was thinking, Rosaline, of um, Henry James and, oh, <laughs> and late Henry James. You know, everyone knows those sentences are so loopy and they go on such a long time. And I've read once, I'm not sure where, I'm not sure if this is even true, but apparently when Henry James got an amanuensis um, to type up his work for him or to write up his work for him, he would dictate as he was pacing the length of his study. And apparently you can work out how wide his study was by where the comma comes, because he would walk and talk, turn, pause, walk and talk, turn, pause. Lovely. And so apparently some of late Henry James style um, is due to, to that process, I suppose that embodiment, you know, the, the, the having an amanuensis and him walking as he, as he was dictating it. And you know what I love, and it's very awkward for someone to see me do this. I love it. When I'm talking, and when I'm writing, and Olivia is with me, you spoke earlier about rhythm and lyricism, and I, my body goes into a, almost a, a rocking mode. Uh, it looks as if I'm distressed, but it's not. It's a release. It's a liberation to be able to, you know, give a whole paragraph. And all of you would say, slow down, slow down. But I, or when I'm doing a play, if I'm writing a character, I will get one of my family to read what I've written. And then they would pull me into their rhythm. Mm -hmm. And I think words are, are not static, but they're dynamic. And they're in your body, they're in your head. And there has to be a, a lyricism or a, a movement. And I suppose terrible policy is all about movement. So why wouldn't my body respond when I do my work? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I, I love that. I always used to think for a long time, Rosaline, that I wasn't a very good writer because I'm no good on metaphor. I'm no good on simile. I'm oh, no good on lyrical passages of description. I would disagree. I would disagree. Uh, no, it took me years to realize that what I can do is rhythm. And my short stories, I wrote short stories for a decade without them coming to life. They just didn't work. And when they started, it was so painful and so humiliating, really, because I was a published novelist and my short stories just wouldn't work. But when they started working for me, it was when I started recognizing that I could do rhythm and I could do, um, you know, tone and I could do that music, music, musical thing. And I started thinking of my short stories, not as plots, but as spells, you know, that if you had all these words in the right order, they would conjure up a feeling in the body, you know, or in the soul for the reader. And funnily, that's, that's when my stories started working. Um. I'm reading at the moment the woman who wrote a uh, girl, woman, other, mm -hmm. Bernadine. 
You know the woman I told Yes, Bernadine Evaristo. Yeah, yeah she wrote a, a manifesto about how she started to write. And um, I really like Lucy. I like the way she writes about racism because as an Irish traveler, I didn't know how to do it. I mean, I've only read in Ireland, I've only read maybe the Black experience mm-hmm. from Black women and men. But I've only read about travelers by settled writers. Mm-hmm. And it was very hard to train myself and to be confident. Mm-hmm. No. I don't have to look out. I can look in. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'd love to talk a little bit now about Unsettled. Rosalind, this is the gorgeous edition that I have with Mo Kelly's picture. Oh, it's just beautiful. And um, you, you, it's a collection of 16 essays, um, some very personal, some very political. It's so many of its reviews have called it fearless. Um, Anne called it fearless when she was introducing it. And I wondered, was was fear something you felt writing it or something you had to grapple with? Yes. Mm-hmm. I live with fear. I know fear. And I think as writers, we have a universal fear. But I, I would know it's a physical fear, you know, how fear, fear has, fear is brought on by a knowing that there is a definite intent and that intent is usually about violence and denigration. But I also think fear can conjure up a barrier where we don't allow ourselves to move beyond that fear. And, but yeah, I was fear. I was full of fear. My family exposing myself and would I be good enough? Am I a writer? What am I to say that the world hasn't heard? Well, you know, of course. I was reading recently the book Negative Space by Christine Leach, the art critic, um, and she's also a yoga teacher. And she was talking about how our throat is intimately connected to our vaginal muscles. And so she said that when people, usually men, try to silence women with threats of physical violence or with abusive terms for the female physiology, it's to do not just with a threat of sexual violence, but also to, to, to silence, to silence in the throat. And I thought that was... That was such an interesting, such an interesting idea. Yeah, but I also think in my community, we're full of shame. Mm-hmm. And we end up shaming each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to give in to that silence of shame. And I'm really glad I didn't. I'm really glad that, you know, it's, it's okay for traveler women to talk about sex. It's okay that, you know, that if fear is ever present, but fear won't kill you. It might be beside you, 
all the time. And then the beautiful and vulnerability around fear. But you have to work with that vulnerability and own it and almost cherish it. Because I feel people who are long home about their work and show no fear. I'm not sure they're able to reach themselves or anyone else. You know, and the beautiful thing about when I did the book, lots of women, particularly disabled women, of all ages, young ones, who are way smarter than I ever be, but young ones come up and say, and I'm really glad you wrote that. That's how I feel. Or that happened to me. Or I worry about that. Uh, you know, but fear is it's the balance between motivation and resistance, I think. That's so beautifully put, Rosaline. Um, and you, I had it, there was a, one of the quotes from the book that I found very striking is when you articulate this by saying the traveler lens and the traveler genre in its written form are fairly new. To write like a traveler feminist means holding this space on the page, extending the paragraph, subtly explaining the nuances of simultaneous discrimination, but it's also about honoring your place and never emasculating. And there's so much that's so complex and rich and such a delicate balance there. And I found it so um, heartening that for you as a feminist and as a traveler feminist, the way that you are creating that space for other women is not by emasculating, is not by, it's by recognizing that we need the, you know, we need the divine feminine, which has been so subjugated in Irish society, but we need the divine masculine as well. All of us are both, you know, anima and animus. And I found it so, um, so heartening to, to read about how you create this space because it come, becomes, I think, a portal for other young women. It, it feels a very generous space that you've created with your book. But do you not feel in your book you have a duty of care to your readers. Do you feel that way? Absolutely. I feel as well, Rosalie, I know that some of the things that we've both written about, um, for me, that would include teen suicide. It would include postpartum struggles. It would include, you know, sexual violence or mental health, whatever the case might be, I always feel that if I were writing that to shock, or if I were writing that for gratuitous or cheap effect, that would be the moment to stop because it only becomes something of worth, whether it's real or imagined, whether it's your own experience or a version of your own experience or an imagined experience, it only becomes worthwhile if you can somehow turn that darkness into something transmute it, you know, turn it into something that others can benefit from. Yeah, I was looking the other day when, when I was thinking about my new book, Remember Doris Lesson. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever read Doris. Yes, yes, yes. I remember reading her as a young one and I didn't understand it. And then I went back as we all do. As an animal, and as I've been able to have the capacity to read. But I was really struck. She writes about periods mm -hmm. and menstruation. And I was thinking, at that time, Doris might have been the first of a few women who put that on page. And therefore, it was easy for other generations mm -hmm. to, to write about our bodies 
because of Doris and other women of that generation who were so courageous in the work they did. I also felt Lucy. I don't have children, and that's very painful. But I do have lots and lots and lots of nieces and nephews. And I wanted to write something that would spur them on, that would that would that would make them want to read and write. You know what I mean? I also wanted to maybe have that critical eye on saying you've shut travelers up for so long. And while we were subjugated, we did our own work. We did our work on the quiet. No, I I don't think I was being generous. I think what I was doing was, I hope I, I'm doing lowering the ramp or lowering the ladder for other traveling women and for disabled women to rise beyond our impairment. You know, because many of us get stuck in our body. I think we need to imagine and create all sorts of lives. Yes, Rosalie, when you were talking about shame earlier, I was thinking about how shame is such a silencing thing. You know, when one feels shame in the body, for me anyway, you want to close down, shrivel up, maybe cease to exist. You don't want anyone to look at you. You don't. And I was thinking of how so much of the, the change that started to happen in Irish society in the last few years with, with the referendums, with the, um, the, the bill, the, the hate crime bill to give travelers and other um, you know, black minority ethnic people protections under Irish law. And it seems crazy that that wasn't until 2021, but these changes that have been happening and everything that's coming up with the mother and baby, I feel my, I want to say home, you know, in inverted commas, because they weren't. Uh, everything that's happened seems to be people refusing shame. And a lot of it seems to be. I think it's wonderful. I think it's wonderful. As individuals, as a collective, as a country, if we just clear the decks, mm -hmm. clear the decks, and recenter ourselves, and recenter our morality and our compasses to have a much broader understanding of what human decency is for the gender. Shame is a weapon of war. It's a weapon of torture. It's a weapon of denigration for children. Shame is a form of cruelty. You know, humiliation. I just think I'm so grateful to be alive. And to see this change happen, and to see our young people and our older people say, enough, we don't have to live that way anymore. We, we don't have to talk in whispers. And I also think in recent times, women who were Raped or abused, owning their anonymity and saying, This is what happened to me. And they're standing on the courtroom and they're 
They didn't know I don't want to be anonymous. By being anonymous, I'm holding on to my shame. So I just think it's wonderful. And I also think James as a tool for writings is very interesting. But we have public shame and then we have private shame. And how those two shames rub off each other can often create a very interesting tension. I've heard both Kevin Barry and George Saunders um, talk about how for a writer, if you go to a, if, if you find a place, Kevin Barry calls it a hotspot, I think. If you find a place where you're ashamed, he says that's the place that readers are going to connect with. When yeah. you're... And I, I adore Kevin Barry. I just, he's a wonderful writer and he's a wonderful person. Yeah. He's been very generous to me. Um, but I, I just think shame is like, how do you describe shame? It's a whole paragraph that doesn't make sense. Do you know what I mean? It, it's a very interesting um, passage of the humans' reality, how we're shamed, and then how we tell that story. Mm -hmm. I remember once, I was in Belfast mm -hmm. with a group of friends, and it was the afternoon, and we were in a, a pub, and one of my friends had just uh, had, uh, had a baby eight or nine months, Previous, a beautiful bundle, and her, the mother of the baby came in and threw some money on the table in front of all of us. And there was no language. He just put the money and went. And that woman, I could feel her. Even though we all loved her, and we all, you know, but that, that he shamed her. Mm -hmm. He shamed her, and he shamed her child. And this, a lack of discretion, mm -hmm. a lack of not being able to put the other first, but always put the other last. You know, where did we learn that? Rosaline, you've asked me to read a little bit of your book, um, which I will do. This is only, um, this is a, just over a page. Um, this is one of the, the some of these essays are, are long, some of them are very short and almost like poetry. And this is one of the latter. This is, um, I am not your knacker. So, um, Rosaline, I am not your knacker. Tinker, the old description, itinerant, the idiom, knacker, a whispered taunt, abo, hori maori, knacker. The schoolyard, a kick, a shove, a thump, consistent, predictable, knacker. We oscillate in and out of the historian's pleasure. We are a nuisance he cannot account for. Our shadowy presence viewed through a lens tapered and rigid. Our algorithms romanticized, simplified through the lingering settled gaze, the legacy of misfits. Our task, assimilate, absorb, evaporate. Your task, reduce, essentialize, reject. Constant surveillance, curiosity versus accuracy, veneration versus abomination. Your pernicious attention, wanting the exotic, the worthy. One voice, one image, an emblem, your fear, contamination. Family, heritage, identity. The beat of our culture belongs with our children, armoured with pride. Their dance is one of resilience, resistance and representation. The pendulum that swings and clashes. They are our strength, our voice, our integrity, our survival. Official ethnic status. 
This new embrace is choking. My gauzy ghost plagues me. Speechless, motionless, damaged. Scabs of neglect, delicate, riddled with rage, wordless. This colonized body profiled, policed and politicized. On the outskirts of the town, next to a landfill, pushing us to the edge of a road, a queue, a sentence. The traveler evaporates, the knacker remains. I mean, <laughs> it's incredibly powerful to read, to read those words and, you know, to feel the, the rhythms of them and to feel the power of them. And it feels, reading that, you know, feels something very akin to maybe a sort of spoken word. Um, I hear so much poetry in it. I hear so much, um, you know, it, recently in Irish Irish letters, um, people have been doing really interesting things with the essay form, you know, stretching the possibilities of it and stretching what it can be. And there are some of your essays that are written in a more traditional um, prose, a more memoir type prose, um, and you write journalism as well. But I, I wanted to ask, um, when you're writing some of your essays, do you have a sense that you're writing something akin to poetry? Do you feel a sort of oral tradition that you're drawing on? Um, how do you move between prose forms? I really wanted to write those words. I am not your nestler. I really wanted to do it. And Lucy, it took me 10 years, 10 years to be able to say it mm -hmm. and then write it. And I wanted young travelers. I wanted young travelers not to have to put up with what my generation put up with. And I wanted to say, tell them you're not your nothing. Tell them. And there's also a bit about people being fetishized. Mm -hmm. no, you're a good traveler and she's a bad traveler. Or, you know, I remember once I had a teacher say to me, and all we do for you. And I thought, you're a teacher. You do it for all of us, not just me. I don't, I, in another life, I would have loved to be a poet in another life. But I think subconsciously my speech impediment stops me from believing that I could be a poet. And therefore, poems becomes a conditioner. Rosalie, this is one of those moments that I wish we had our audience live with us because I'm sure everyone would agree with me that that's just poetry. You know, when I read it, you can feel it. That's that's poetry. I remember I asked a 17-year-old 17, 17 traveler woman to read it. And she was a young one. And I remember crying. When I, when I, when I, and she was crying. And, and it was one big puddle of poetry and poems. But I, I, I suppose, yeah, I wanted a weapon. And I know that's the wrong word. But I wanted some sort of retaliation. Mm -hmm. They look, we're not. You can't treat us that way. You can't call us that horrible name anymore. It's very damaging. But I also wanted some sort of 
context mm -hmm. and explanation and rather than start with the local or the general I wanted to go to the particular as well the reasons the Maori people and the Aboriginal people it felt even more real but I would love to be a poet yeah, I think you are. I think you are. I love poetry. Yeah, likewise. Um, there's, there's. I want to ask about um, from the outside, um, from a more settled, from a settled perspective, it feels to me that there seems something of a a cultural renaissance in the traveler world community. I'm thinking of another book published by Skeen Press absolutely beautiful book by Owen de Vardun um, called Why the Moon Travels, in which he, each chapter starts with a traveler story, an Irish traveler story, and then a folk tale, and then he gives it some specific context from his own childhood. Um, and I'm thinking of, <laughs> I have my, my water jug that I've been pouring my water from. This is um, from a collective called We Make Good, and it's made by a, a tinsmith, the sort of traditional way. Um, and we make good have not just traveler goods, but they 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 sell things made in traditional ways, and they promote traveler traveler arts and or traveler crafts. And I'm thinking of um, uh, Dr. Cindy Joyce, who is in her own words Minster Bure, and who is a Council of State member, a university lecturer in sociology, um, Senator Eileen Flynn first traveler to be elected to the Senate in 2020. I know you ran yourself a couple of times. And so I, I wonder, um, do, do you feel that there is a renaissance? Do you feel that there's more visibility for settled people um, of, of traveler culture, um, traveler politics, traveler history? Or do you feel that having travelers people of, from a traveler community in positions of cultural authority or in positions of political authority opens the way for others. What do you think from your perspective? I think, I don't think about settled people. Mm -hmm. I think it's a wonderful opportunity for travelers. I think there is most definitely a traveler renaissance. Mm -hmm. I really think there is. And That's, it's wonderful, wonderful to hear that. But I also think that I'm, why are certain people so shocked? Why are they, you know, I've known this. I've known how rich our culture is. And I'm not just talking about songs or stories, but I've done on so many different levels. I also think that there is a danger that people like me and Owen and Sydney and Eileen uh, that the general public may perceive that, that other travelers don't experience racism or they're living in very poor conditions and have been for a long time. I also think it's an interesting point and moment in our culture where we get a chance to talk openly about the pain and the damage racism done to our forebears. You know, I know Sydney and Owens do a lot of history work. And I also 
I feel there isn't enough of us. There, there's never enough. When I write a play, it's very difficult to find tabla actors, tabla directors, other tabla writers, and tabla technicians, sound engineers. No, the chosen few, which I want, were not enough. And, and also, we need that grouping. We need more diversity. Mm -hmm. you know, and I just think it's wonderful. I get very emotional. And I think it's a, it's a powerful moment to witness and to be part of and to feel. I've been a writer for a long time and suddenly there's this explosion of equality, diversity and inclusion. And what I don't agree with is I do feel that the opportunities for travelers. I wonder what our next generation will write about, what will they sing about, how will we harness this renaissance. I also think settled critics I don't pay much attention because I'd rather have my work critiqued by a traveler or by many, even if they rip it apart, even if they tell me there's nothing in it, there's no authenticity. I'd rather hear that from one of my own. And I think that outside gays, I know one critic about a player wrote, also talked about how clean I was in the way I present myself. Lucy, that wouldn't happen. You know what I mean? I also think I am so very grateful to African American writers. You know, Alice Walker, I know Angelo, a whole load of people who, who validated our experience before anyone else did. Um, but I do think we're living in a, a tremendous moment of excitement and possibility and, and also I'm very proud of I'm very, very proud of where we came from and how we're Sustaining our, our sustaining and protecting our identity. You know, we're, we're now culture, culturally, we're now custodians of our own culture. And yeah, I do think it's brilliant. I wish, I, I wish, I hope. In 10 years, I can look back and see the, the work that's been done by lots of, you know, lots of travelers in lots of areas. And also that issues of suicide and other issues will subside because of these new 
avenues. And also, I have to say again and again, for me as a writer, it was other writers who were generous, the writers who were generous enough to read my work and motivate me and mentor me and pull me in, who never tried to say, Oh, when you need to write that, like it's another person. You know, there was a new enlightenment. Yeah, incredibly powerful, Rosaline, to hear you say all of that and, and to talk like that. Um, my final question, where, where I could carry on listening and listening and listening to all you have to say. Um, my, my final question, um, I wanted to ask you, Two questions, really, if, if you're able. Um, I wanted to ask about your book in a lot of ways is about freedom. Some of the freedoms are your father teaching you how to drive, um, the freedoms of the Eos Dana when you were elected and the Canuas at the stipend allowed you to employ Olivia, um, which was a sort of freedom. Um, other, you talk about, say, when the girls in your residential home did not get motorized wheelchairs, but the boys do, the boys did. And that was another type of, um, of, of not a freedom. What is freedom for you going forward? You know, you, you are, I've got a list here of, of some of some of the things that you are, some of your labels, and you are, um, where's, where's, where's my list? You are, um, there's so many different things you are. Um, an activist, an academic, an activist, a playwright, a writer of short stories, um, you know, a, a member of the board of Pavi Point. Uh, you, you are you're so many wonderful things and you've done so much. Um, do you feel an increased sense of freedom for everything that you're going to write next? Or do you feel an increased sense of responsibility or what, what is freedom for you? I think if we go back to Brian Keenan when he was imprisoned, I think if we look at Nelson Mandela, I think Jane Campion, I don't know whether you remember, but one of my most earliest memories in the cinema was seeing her film Angel at Midhaver. Yes. And it was about a, a, a woman who was incarcerated and misdiagnosed. I think of freedoms. It's then Turner. It's that woman in prison. It's that woman in direct supervision. It's that woman in an institution. It's that woman in a violent relationship. Freedom is, is in your heart and in your mind. It may not be tangible or possible, when you are free as long as you can imagine and as long as you can think and as long as you can put yourself beyond that immediate moment. Does that make sense? Yeah, Rosaline, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one that's going to be in tears. Um, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, what you said and what you articulated so beautiful it, so beautifully it makes such such sense thank you and thank you so much for spending this hour with us and thank you right by the sea this has been such an absolute pleasure talking to you thank you bye bye wow what a wonderful and important conversation so it was amazing hearing you hearing you talk, Rosaline. Thank you so much, Rosaline and Lucy, for giving us the pleasure and the challenge of such a fascinating exchange of views and ideas.
Thank you for so generously sharing your insights on your writing processes and for allowing us access to your hearts and minds so honestly and sincerely. It was lovely to see the warmth and respect that you each have for each other. I think we will all leave this event enriched with our hearts fuller and hopefully changed by our experience here today. You are the embodiment of the power of good writing to change society. You have given us so much to reflect on. Thank you both again. Rosalie and Lucy from Right by the Sea, it has been such a privilege. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.